Oh, hey there, gang. This is an unexpected video. I hadn't planned on filming this one, as this is just supposed to be a simple setup. It's got a high fret and a swap out a volume pot. It's not uninteresting work, but it's pretty routine stuff for this. This is a 1998 American Standard Strat. Uh, however, something just threw a monkey wrench in the works, and I think the game might be afoot. So I decided to turn on the camera. I gotta go email the customer to see what he wants to do because something funny is going on with this truss rod. Okay, I talked to him and he gave the go-ahead. So the action on this thing is a bit high, getting up towards 764 ths and the saddles are a bit low. This is not too unusual. Um, you'd see that and ordinarily you'd assume that maybe the neck needs a little shim in the neck pocket. But the reason this is happening is the neck has a super large amount of forward relief in it. It's more than 25 thousandths of an inch. That's um, 0.63 millimeters. Which is, you know, at least three times what I would want to see on this guitar. So I go to adjust the truss rod. And the first thing I notice is that the Allen key hex wrench here, it goes in, but it doesn't go in very far. Like, it feels like it's just the tip, an eighth of an inch or so. Um, I can loosen it. It's fairly snug. But tightening it, it feels like the nut is bottomed out on the truss rod. Which could happen, but there's other weird stuff going on. This is the Fender Biflex truss rod, and it's got a bit of a reputation. Um, first of all, the nut is buried under this plug here. This is walnut, and um, I think it's designed to be as unobtrusive as possible, trying to look like those old vintage necks from Fender's Golden Age. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, there was no plug here, obviously. Um, I think they made it walnut so that it would match up with the skunk stripe on the back side of the neck. Um, you know, it, was, it used to be just clean, plain maple all the way up to the board because the adjustment for those rods was at the body end. On those guitars, you've got to loosen the neck and remove it or loosen the screws and tip it up enough to access the bolt. That's a bit annoying, especially if you've got a squirrely neck that needs regular adjustment or if you're trying to set up a guitar for the first time when it was really out of whack. It's a lot of back and forth. So in the early 70s, they went to the so-called bullet truss rods, which have a long cylindrical nut that tapers at the end, like a bullet, and it's exposed. You see it on the face of the headstock. Uh, these ones adjust using an eighth of an inch Allen wrench or hex key. They're easier to adjust, but I guess some people didn't like the look of them because... reasons? I don't know. They look fine to me, and they work well, too. In the early 80s, Fender came up with a design that produces a double action. So this rod can bend the neck backwards and counteract string tension like any normal truss rod would, but it can also bend the neck forward in the event that it naturally settles into a back bow when it's at rest. It's rare, but that can happen if you're using extremely light gauge strings, for instance, or the wood has just the inclination to bend that way. Wood is unpredictable. It's still a single rod. It's not an over-under design with two rods that you find on a lot of um, modern dual-action systems. Um, I'll try to find a way of illustrating it, how it actually works. Quick and extremely dirty mock-up here. I hope it won't be too confusing. Uh, pretend this insert nut is the truss rod nut. In the usual situation, the end of the rod is exposed. If you take the cover plate off of your headstock, you'll see threads there. Usually there is a washer down at the end uh, to provide a bearing surface. Take the nut and we spin that on clockwise. And at a certain point it starts to bear against the wood of the neck bending it. Now in the biflex, we add a plug on the other side. Usually a washer there too. So that goes on the other side here. And if we start to turn that nut back counterclockwise, a certain point in the middle there, it's in neutral. It's not exerting force against anything. But if we keep going, 
a certain point it starts to push against the wood of that plug and we have a reverse effect on the neck. It bends in the other direction. The other innovative part of the design is a little anchor. It's like a sleeve that goes around the truss rod and it has a bolt sort of threaded portion that um, is accessible underneath the seventh fret dot marker here. And that's important because what it does is it keeps the rod in contact with the front face of the curved channel it's sitting in. So the rod is always looking like this. It's bent forward. Um, so that's why that push-pull action has an effect. If it was just straight all the time, um, it wouldn't do very much. But because it's always held tight against the front surface of the neck, um, it can move backwards and forwards with that pressure. So this is a slightly complicated way of going about things. Um, dual action rods were popping up in the 70s and I don't know, maybe there was a patent applied for situation where Fender didn't want to get tooled up to do something that another company might challenge them for. Because there are simpler ways of going about this, um, getting this push and pull action. Here's the usual over and under rod which goes through captured end blocks. And nowadays there are low profile designs using a thin length of steel and the nut itself is actually welded onto the lower rod. It's all one unit. Um, these have the advantage for the home builder of being able to be installed into a straight channel without a curved bottom, so which is really difficult to replicate at home. Making a fender neck is not that easy. So it's possible they didn't want to stray too far from Leo's original design, just having the single rod um, and keeping that curve in there. You know, purists might say that it changes the tone, because Fender is another one of these companies that really is you know, I don't know, tied to their history in a way that is not always a good thing. They have to, you know, fight their own customers if they want to change. But this works fine. Um, it can cause some issues. Number one is it uses an eighth of an inch, just over a three millimeter hex key, which is pretty small. Uh, there's not much wall surface against which those facets engage, so you know, if you don't ins insert it securely, it's very easy to strip these nuts out. Squires and most of the non-California made guitars these days have a larger um, hex head. It's a 4 millimeter or 5 30 seconds. It does make a difference. You know, they stopped using the Biflex for most models sometime in the late 90s, I think. But it lasted longer on some of them than others. I mean, I know until very recently, at least, it was used in the... Fender Professional Series. I don't know if the new Pro 2 ones have it or not. I haven't seen one of those yet. You know, there are even some Mexican-made ones that look like they've got a Biflex in them, but they're not. They're the standard straight rod. The other thing that can happen, and I don't know if this is the case here yet, but I'm starting to suspect it. I took a picture. I'll show you in a few minutes here. Is that the small cross-section of these wrenches makes it possible to snap them off in the hole if you try and over tighten the nut. In some guitars it's possible to exert enough force to compress the wood against which the truss rod nut is bearing and possibly run out of threads because the truss rod isn't threaded all the way down. At some point you reach the end. You can squish that wood in there, you reach the end of the threads. Usually it's the rod that breaks at that point point. and unless it's a valuable neck you'll write it off and buy a new one because the cost to save it by excavating and cutting some new threads on the broken end is about as much as you would pay for a replacement neck. So like, you know, unless it's vintage, you're probably going to buy the new one. The hardware which does that is very expensive and there aren't many shops that will outlay that kind of capital expense on spec, so they're not usually on hand. Stumac knows this and they'll charge accordingly. The nut pocket is exceptionally deep on these guitars and you need, you basically, you, you absolutely have to have a longer than usual Allen key to fit in there. If you use a standard one, it's not deep enough. You bump into the L part. Uh, so some people will try and use longer T-shaped handle um, or perhaps do the thing where they're angling down with a longer end 
sometimes with a ball end, because the other thing is you've got a string tree in the way. I asked the customer, and he says that it was last adjusted at a well-regarded shop last year sometime, and the setup was not great when he got it back. He didn't want to be a complainer. I'm not going to out the shop, because from a professional standpoint, it's just not good practice. I would say, though, that most honest repair people I know want to hear if you're not satisfied. I had to take a still photo to show you inside. I couldn't make it work in video mode. You can see the depth of the nut and how it looks to me like there's something inside it. Uh, so this is the main challenge with the biflex rods. If you strip something out or if you bottom it out on the thread, you can't just pull the nut out. You've got to somehow remove this plug that's around it. And you know it's glued in place to resist the pressure of adjusting against it. So this is a job I know about, but I've never actually done before. I'm going to order a new nut and also a replacement plug in case I have to cut this one to pieces to get it out of there. Uh, I'm going to see if I can try and do it without destroying it, but it's good to be safe, you know. I'm going to see if I can rig up a nichrome wire resistance heater and put it into a plug that will fit snugly into this hole and warm this up. To get things started, I'll take this standard hardwood dowel and start shaving it off a bit using my violin peg shaver, just to reduce the diameter a bit. After that, I'll use what's known as a swage block, which has a number of different diameters uh, of hole drilled into a piece of steel. I can pound this through and make an accurately sized dowel. I've shown the small diameter resistance heaters for use in neck removal before. That was a length of stainless tubing into which I'll run some nichrome wire, which is surrounded by a high temperature insulating wire sleeve. The nichrome touches the stainless tubing at its end to complete the circuit, and it builds up quite a lot of heat pretty fast. So I'll be insulating it with the dowel here. I'll put the stainless tube into that. That'll take up the space in between the heater and the plug in the guitar so that, uh, you know, I'm not going to singe things or burn it up. In use, I connect negative and positive leads to the tubing and nichrome, respectively, and current is fed in from a DC power supply. I measure the temperature of the dowel and the surrounding plug in the area around the neck with a thermal couple probe on my multimeter. I try to keep it around 100 degrees Celsius, just over 200 Fahrenheit, because I'm not trying to sear the wood. It's low and slow cooking here, and it actually takes about 15 minutes to transfer enough heat into the neck that I'm confident the glue is ready to give way, at which point I can pull out the heater and I start to withdraw the nut to put pressure on that walnut plug. This is a very fine thread, remember, so it's going to take a lot of turns. At a certain point I can feel and hear a sort of gentle pop, and the plug starts to advance out of the hole a little bit more with each turn. Eventually the nut reaches the end of the rod, and there's no more force against the plug, so I resort to pliers to extract it. This could be reused, but I think I'll go ahead and put in a fresh one when the time comes. And here we get a look at the nut itself, which you can see it's nearly the same diameter as the plug. There's no way to extract that with the plug in place, it's just too large. Ordinarily this would be a tunnel. You can see right through it. It's definitely blocked up. So, let's see if we can dislodge whatever it is. Yeah, I think this is the ball end, or the tip of a ball end uh, Allen key. And there's your problem. This thing did very well for itself. You can see it didn't burn up. It's probably good for another use. So, I'm waiting for the replacement nut. The first one got lost in shipping, so while they send me another, I can get into what this job was really supposed to be all about. This volume pot here has been subjected to a lot of solder, or solder, and probably too much heat, or heat. If you leave the iron in contact for too long, it'll burn up the mechanism inside. Uh, this is something you learn to deal with, it's intuition. You want enough heat to really flow the solder, or solder, but not too much. Um, for removal like this, I tend to like my big, ugly 60-watt iron here. 
it gets things flowing really quickly. Okay, the nut finally came in. And here's what the plug looks like. These are the same length. The new one has a slightly more shallow chamfer on the bottom for the back side. And it isn't actually broached all the way through. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's just different. And the new one seems to be one thousandth of an inch uh, smaller in diameter. Which is fine with me. I want to go ahead and lube up those threads just a little bit before I install this. Now, before I install the new nut, I need to address the situation that brought us here. Uh, the owner says it needed continual adjustment, even before this last setup, he was always having to play with the truss rod. That doesn't sound good, to be honest. And it's very difficult to see if the wood has compressed past the end of the threads, because it's such a deep hole, like there's a marking here on this stick, I marked it out. The bearing surface starts back here, around the first fret. And the bearing surface is actually, well, it's like a thick washer, it's about half an inch thick, and it's press fit into the hole. And there's wood behind it. So it's possible that has been pushed back and continually compressed things. So I'm going to try and put a little super glue in there and get it to wick around the corners. It's doubtful that that is going to do anything, that it could penetrate all the way to the wood, but I have to at least try. There's nothing else I can really do. Um, the other thing is I'm going to put a spacer washer in there too before I put in the nut. So this is about two and a half millimeters thick and that will give me a little bit more room to play around with for tightening. You know, I'll see what happens. I guess the other thing I could do if need be is glue in a short length of 3 8 inch dowel in front of that metal bearing surface just to provide more resistance, more glue surface. Um, I'm not too concerned about losing length on the walnut plug because it's purely decorative in this case. You know, this neck is never going to backbow on us. It's always going to be in tension rather than compression. So, you know, this is just filling space in the hole. Got an extra long whip tip on here. Be really careful not to get any on the threads. Actually, that soaks around that last washer just fine. And I'm going to try to angle the neck so that it's always running downhill, not building up on the surface. Okay, I've tightened the nut until there's just the lightest, lightest amount of pressure on it. And you can see that this is the neck and basically it's resting state. A lot of relief. Let's sand that surface a little bit in preparation for glue. I'll insert the plug and mark it so I can saw off some of the excess. I don't want too much glue here, just enough so that it's not going to be squeezing down into the hole, fouling the threads or something. So, shouldn't be too much squeeze out, but it should be glued in place. We'll get to that magic moment that everyone loves. Sharp knife, careful movements. Don't cut too deep. I'll try and get it as flush as possible using a razor blade scraper. Then I'll apply a little shellac to the surface to seal it up. I can go overboard in the finishing here. To make it really look like it had never been touched, I would have to probably overspray the headstock, which is something I wasn't willing to do. So we ended up in a happy place. The action is 4 64ths. 16th of an inch, 1.5 millimeters. The relief is around 8 thousandths, which is okay. And now there's another trick in the bag for taking out these plugs. There's not much more to show you other than how the pickups sound.